Thank you, Rupert, and thank you for the ladies on the panel who I'll introduce um, to all of you in a moment. Um, so my name's Eric Baber. I'm the Product Training direct Director with Cambridge University Press. Um, as some of you might be aware, I also have a long-time involvement with IATEFL, the International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language. There's a name and a half. And what we'll be looking at is, so what does success uh, look like? We've, been, we've heard two and a half days of a rich and varied number of talks. Obviously, a measure of success is language. And here are some of the talks that we've heard on that subject. Real world English, what should we teach? Creating a communicative classroom for primary learners. Spoken grammar, why is it important? So obviously language is an important measure of success, but it goes way beyond that. We've had talks on 21st century skills. Are we asking the right questions? Data and learning in the digital age, which in itself may not necessarily have that much to do with language, but we feel now is important. Developing global competence in ELT. <coughs> Positive education, yesterday's closing speaker, and then obviously Zoltan's talk just now, motivating L2 learners and teachers through vision. So I'm joined here, and the people who are actually going to be doing the bulk of the hard work is Laura Patsko, you may have um, seen already in the, in the program. She'll be speaking for, for about seven minutes as part of this panel now on how can research help us define success. We'll then move on to Lenise, who is the National Director of Language Programs of UVM in Mexico. And she will be talking about what skills and competences should be included in the evaluation of students. So we'll be looking at learners, what constitutes success for the learner. And then Silvana will give us another seven minutes on what does success mean for the teacher and the school? What should they be held accountable for? There'll be lots of time for question and answers and I will have a task for you to do as well. We'll be pulling together some of the strands of this conference and we'll be looking at when all is said and done, when we look at all of these different factors, what actually constitutes success for the whole learning process. So, Laura, could I pass over to you please to talk about how can research help us define success? I've got seven minutes. You've got seven minutes. Go. Ready? <laughs> so I'm talking about how research can help us define success. And when we hear about research today, we often hear about the concept of big data. This idea of gathering and mining enormous data sets to help us discover general patterns, which might then be turned to some kind of rule which we can apply widely or even universally to guarantee success, which sounds great. Right? And it is useful to try and simplify the individualism of learning by looking at what the masses and the majority have in common. But learning is nevertheless a very personal process. And from person to person, there's considerable individual variation. So when we conduct research into learning to try to define or discover what constitutes or what promotes success, there's a balance to be struck between identifying some general principles of effective learning, and then identifying and hopefully addressing individual parameters and practices, which also play a significant part. So I'm going to give two illustrative examples, which I've imagined, but I hope they'll be familiar. So principle number one, motivation is key to learning, as we've seen this morning in the plenary. And so let's look at four individual learners and what this might mean for them not as a general principle, but their individual parameters, how they themselves enact this. So there's uh, Maria, let's call her. She's 27, she's from Colombia. And she feels motivated when she can understand a song in English and sing along. There's Murat, he's 35, he's from Turkey. And he's motivated by the desire to communicate with the family of his Australian wife. There's Helen, she's 19, she's from China. She's motivated by the need to pass her IELTS exam, which in turn is motivated by her desire to study engineering at a university in Scotland where English is the medium of instruction. And then we have Claudio, and he's in his 50s. He's from Italy. He works for a German company, and he travels a lot on business. So he's motivated by the need to understand and be understood by fellow business people around the world. So we have this one general principle that we want to research is motivation. And we, we might start with a very general question as well. What will motivate my students? 
but we also need to research on a, on a more focused level how that looks in practice for individual people. And principle number two, my second illustrative example, we know from research that effective communicators select from and adapt their language according to their audience. So using our same four examples, for Maria, she has a great knowledge of informal and figurative and poetic language from her love of music, but she's worried about her upcoming job interview because that's a very different audience than her shower when she's singing. <laughs> <laughs> then there's Murat. He knows a range of respectful ways to address his wife's parents and a range of more romantic ways to address his wife. And to his children, he speaks in Turkish. So also a conscious, informed choice about language, according to his audience. Helen knows the distinctions between formal and informal expressions very well, which is likely to lead to appropriate choices when she's writing in her exam. And Claudio was very fluent and very accurate in business meetings and giving presentations, but less confident at social English, for example, when he's taking his clients to dinner. So we know from research that it's very important for all of these people to be able to adapt their language according to their audience and their context. But what we also need to learn from research is what that means in a wide variety of contexts for a wide variety of audiences. So each of these learners would define their learning success quite differently. And when we conduct research into learning, we need to reflect and to respect this variation. Because while research can help us derive general principles, the way they look at the level of an individual learner is quite variable. So in my view, this means that general principles can be addressed in, for example, materials and classroom tools, learning tools. And the individual parameters can be defined and addressed best by people, by teachers, and by the learners themselves, of course. So the research that I do in my job at CUP it looks particularly at the interaction between these two areas. So if reality is so complex, then how can research actually help us define success? And I think perhaps the most important thing to remember is that the definition of success is determined, first of all, by how we've defined our goals and what vision we have, as we heard this morning. And that means that we need to ask the right questions and we need to be sensitive to inherent and to inherited assumptions. For example, one inherent assumption in the question I was once asked, how can stories help children learn a second language? Inherently, this assumes that stories can help them learn a second language, and that may be true, but when we're formulating our questions for research, we need to be quite specific or we won't get specific answers. An example of an, in, in, an inherited assumption, how can we make sure our students will be understood by native speakers? This assumes that the people they're interacting with and listening to them will be native speakers, which in 2016 is probably not often the case. So assuming we've got clear questions, what tools can we use for our investigations? Just a couple of examples of things that I've used in my own work answering a wide variety of questions. Questionnaires, again remembering to ask the right questions and the importance of designing a questionnaire cannot be overstated. Classroom observations, very useful for looking at teacher behavior and any possible gap between teachers' beliefs and their practices. Metadata from digital environments, so the time spent on task, number of attempts, and so on. And the researchers themselves, of course, are invaluable. I have to say that, of course. Um, because it's not enough to have data, you need to interpret it. So to summarize, the definition of success hinges on the definition of goals and asking the right questions because there are many factors involved and lots and lots of individual variation. So the most important thing is not only asking the right questions but then also interpreting the findings appropriately and sensitively with reference to a particular context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Yeah. We're laughing at each other because yesterday she sent me a, an email, Laura sent me an email saying that she had rehearsed her, her, her uh, contribution and it was seven minutes and five seconds. So I sort of tutted and said, oh, I don't know about that. And it just now she showed me her clock, it's seven minutes and five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Laura. Um, I think in addition to asking the right questions and then finding the answers, the one thing that really jumped out at me, a key word there, was that of, of setting the goal. Um, what is it that we or they are trying to achieve? And obviously a key we or they there are the students. So without further ado, Lenise, can I hand over to you? Okay. There is the clicker. So Lenise will now um, tell us a little bit about what she thinks uh, is a measure of success for, for students, for her learners. Thank you. So I want to jump right in by saying that this is a room full of great minds. And when you put this kind of a mix of people together, a lot of big ideas come out. And I'm going to break the mold a little bit in the presentation and actually provide some slides because I was thinking about this idea of debate and discussion. And I'm going to throw some comments up there that not all of you will agree with. Hopefully, not all of you will not agree with it because uh, <laughs> then I'm in trouble. Um, but some, some key ideas that I want to share with you about this idea of success in what we are um, looking at in competencies, competencies and skills with our students. So perhaps afterwards we can, we can debate about them. And there is a caveat to what I'm going to say, um, or a warning perhaps. And those two ideas there are that nothing should be evaluated that we're not explicitly working with our students on in the classroom. And I think that as colleagues who observe teachers, we see this happen a lot. And we see this happen a lot, especially with competencies that are a bit harder, or a bit more difficult to evaluate. The second is, that nothing should be evaluated that is not as specified in the course outcomes. That doesn't mean you can't include other things in the classroom, but don't evaluate them unless they've been specified in the outcomes. The implications for that, however, is that everything that you propose to work with your students on does need to be included in an evaluative manner in the curriculum and needs to be shared with your learners and other stakeholders. And that can seem overwhelming at times. But if we don't include those things, especially when we talk about some of, there's many words out there, right? We talk about 21st century skills, we talk about soft skills, we talk about the social competencies, we've talked about the global competencies. If they're not included specifically, we sort of take away their importance. Right? So that's a little bit of the caveat for what I'm about to share with you. Um, I hope we can agree so far. Um, so coming back to the question, what skills and competencies should be included in the evaluation of students when we're looking for success in English language learning, I wanted to share with you sort of a quick idea of what I see as skills and competencies. These don't come from necessarily one specific um, source. That's why they're not quoted there. So. I'm not going to quote myself, but these are my ideas coming together from, from what I have read about these two ideas. And I think it's a pretty good definition that a skill is something we can use in the classroom to carry out predetermined results. Okay, The language skills, we really know where we're trying to get to with the language skills. Even some of the sub-skills when we talk about pronunciation and whatnot, we have a predetermined result for where we want to be with those skills. Whereas competencies discuss more the how of how we're working with our students. These include things like abilities, behaviors, attitudes um, that lead to being able to fulfill complex demands in language learning, right? And I would propose today that our responsibility as language teachers goes much farther than just language. I think that we can agree with that. We've been talking about it all week. What I want to talk to you a little bit about is that in my experience with teachers, and I come from a small school in Mexico, I work with about 1,500 teachers. We have 140,000 students, and I spend a significant amount of time looking at what teachers are doing in the classroom. But what we do is that these traditional methodologies or communicative methodologies are sort of built around us discussing foods, hobbies, what we like, what we dislike, our families, our jobs. The reason that happens is because we're very comfortable sort of putting the language into topics or chunks despite the fact that uh, providers of materials like Cambridge provide very nice communicative activities. What we see in the classroom is that the teachers sort of leave those as the extra at the end. We might never get to them. It's easier to work with what I like and dislike. And it's very difficult to bring in those higher level or higher order thinking skills into the classroom. However, my proposal is that when we look at competencies, we do know what our students are capable of developmentally at the different ages that we're working with. And there's no reason we should take sort of these 
chunks of language and make them easily to digest by taking the academic discourse out of the classroom. And what I mean by that, and I think that this is where some of you might disagree with me or might think I'm nuts. I want to give a nod to Silvana and say that, first of all, I am not proposing that we all move towards a, a CLIL sort of teaching um, strategy. We're probably all not ready for that, and we're probably not ready for the same level of, of thinking activities as we might be in other classroom uh, areas. And I also want to say that curriculum programs need to be built around the needs of the students, okay? And that, that is both the perceived need, but also the real need, need of our students, okay? And that means that no program is one size fits all, and we have to get better at adapting our programs and stop covering the book, right? Which is what you probably hear from your teachers as I do. I hope so, because I don't want to be alone in this when the teacher will say, I just have to cover the book. Ugh, that's not really what it's about, okay? But on the other hand, if the student doesn't need it, if it can't be achieved, or it's, if it's too lofty of a goal, and yes, I mean competencies as well, then don't include it, because you need to be realistic about what you're teaching. So what I do propose, however, is that we can get beyond the I and the me which is our comfort zone. It's easier to work with. Students feel motivated because they talk about themselves. And I was just in a wonderful uh, talk about um, changing the way that we look at language learning for those of you that were in the Seoul classroom. That was just amazing and really fed into what I'm talking about a little bit today. But we oftentimes talk about, I mean, how often are we not talking about how do we keep them motivated? We struggle to make the class interesting, even though we're always talking about them. So something just isn't working right. And my proposal is based on these ideas by Byram, who talks about intercultural communicative competence. These are some of the competencies that he proposes we can include in our language teaching and learning that are directly related to competency. If you haven't looked into those, please do. They're very interesting. But I wanted to talk to you of what our experts have said to us this week, because it's been fabulous. I'm sure you all agree. And we heard Dr. Sue Swafield very early in the conference that talked about these competencies. If you look at these, they're very close to what we try to do in the classroom. And this is about leadership theory in learning, right? We also have, and these are big ideas, um, Carrie Jones, if you heard Carrie Jones, how do we get learners onto this track? By asking questions, the important questions, the importance of getting our students to ask questions. And maybe the answer isn't the most important piece of that, right? But helping them learn how to answer those questions. Ben Goldstein, if you were in that um, talk, he talked about global uh, competency, and he alluded to what I mentioned before with the Byram ideas, that this is the newer idea in global competency, how we connect it to language, that learners, as we're teaching now are not necessarily required to respond to or integrate thoughts and feelings into what they're doing in the classroom. Michael McCarthy, of course, co-construction, facilitation of interpersonal bonding, negotiation of meaning, the flow of working with language, and Simon Ward, of course, with positivity and how the question, have we taught curiosity out of our students? Those are all those competencies that we need to think about. Someone once said to me that the skill of a good leader is to steal shamelessly the things that you like can work well, so I'm going to steal his final quote and just leave it up there for you to take a look at. Um, if we can believe that this is true, then the way that we need to teach for success in the classroom with our learners needs to change, and it needs to be focused on these competencies. And that is my challenge to myself, to my institution, and to the rest of you, and I hope we can talk about it when we're finished. Thank you very much, Lenise, with your little school in, down in Mexico. Yeah. Um, Sorry. I'm just going to leave that slide up there while I hand over to the next speaker, because I think it's those last points there that are the ones that are really in question. Um, are these the skills that we need to be teaching or imparting or, uh, to students or encouraging them to develop, a, to develop by themselves and on their own? Um, and then the question, obviously, is how do we measure those? Can I then introduce Silvana, who actually doesn't need any introduction. She opened up the, um, the, the, the conference for us two days ago. Silvana will now talk to us about um, measuring the success, or what are the keys to success for the institution as a whole. The original question was, what does success mean for the teacher and the school? So I'm going to start with the teacher, and then I'm going to move to the school. Success for the teacher. 
For me, successful the teacher is so much more than students being happy with a charismatic entertainer or fun activity management, where you know the teacher sets the task, monitors, checks a bit of you know how the task was done, moves on. First of all, to me, a successful teacher is a teacher of successful students. So in a way, I'm kind of cheating because I'm building on what <laughs> Lenny said. And I want to explore that notion a bit more. So what does that actually mean uh, when, when one is a teacher of successful students? What, what does it mean to be a successful student? So while this is f fundamental, um, you know, that, that the students that we teach become, as a result of our interaction and our work together, successful in terms of meeting their learning goals and achieving, etc., etc. For me, also successful, the teacher, is when the students become, as a result of our time together and our interaction and, and our teaching and learning, more confident, more motivated, more curious, more responsible for their own learning, more self-directing than when they first started learning with that teacher. Success for the teacher is when the students become more intercultural competent, when they become better equipped to live in a global world, when they negotiate uh, an identity as a, as, as a bilingual or a multilingual learner, when students are better, sort of more well-rounded than when they started, more whole as individuals but also as members of communities and society. Now, nothing of what I have just said um, happens by chance or by magic alignment of the stars. It's all a combination of inspirational leadership and that particular fundamental aspect of leadership that Zoltan was talking about, vision. A teacher who has a vision. And careful design. Careful design. A successful teacher is a thinker. I've been teaching for over 25 years and the more I think about it, the more I become convinced that a teacher is here as well as here, but here as well. It's brought about by a professional teacher who understands deeply what their job is and gets on with doing it with passion, with dedication, and without compromise. A successful teacher understands how precious class time is and maximizes both quantity of learning and quality of learning. A successful teacher does not settle for students doing the least that is enough. That, for me, is a mediocre teacher. A successful teacher has high expectations and creates a culture of high expectations. A successful teacher makes learning visible to everybody, to them so that they understand where to go next, but also to the students themselves, to the parents, where that is important, to everybody. A successful teacher understands when leadership means rallying the troops and being at the front, but also when leadership means letting the students take center stage. Beyond the classroom, a successful teacher is a key member of a school team, one who owns the ethos of the organization, a problem solver, a constructive suggestion giver, a consistent role model of professionalism, somebody inspirational, but also a career-long learner, an experimenter, an innovator, a keen consumer, but more importantly, a keen generator of knowledge about teaching and learning and insights about education an expert in their own context. The accountability question. I think teachers should have an important level of accountability for student success, and I said on Wednesday that this should be tighter in our industry. I think we, a teacher who really isn't interested in success, in success as learners being successful, needs to ask themselves the question, how did my teaching influence that success? And, you know, in, in, in different conversations with the managers and the peers, this question should be asked, and we should be asking that question more to ourselves. Successful the school. A school is successful, obviously, when students are successful. So back into the same question, uh, or the same matter. But for me, a school is successful when a school is able to create and maintain the right conditions for everybody's significant learning to take place, not just the students but also every member of the staff in that school. And also to engage with the parents. You know, and, and, and there is a dimension of educating parents as well in a successful school. It is an inclusive environment, welcoming of difference and diversity and responding effectively to diversity and difference. It is able to recruit and retain outstanding staff. 
It provides effective and impactful, impactful professional development, the professional development that makes a difference to student outcomes. It keeps innovating and experimenting. A successful school is forward-looking and future-looking. And again, its vision and its ethos and observable behaviours are congruent. And it, it works on that congruence. It asks itself, is my vision, is my, are my values the same as my practice? It engages actively and creatively with all relevant stakeholders, but it does not bend or compromise its core principles. And finally, a, a successful school inspires other schools and collaborates with other schools very closely. It believes in collaboration above competition. The accountability question. Of course, schools should be able to measure their impact, but not just their impact, but also what value they add to their learner and their lives. How am I doing for time? Because I'm finished. Really? Fantastic. <laughs> okay. We're going to do a couple things for about five minutes and then we'll round things up with Q&A and discussion and a conversation between the panel members as well. Before you arrived here, we sent you a questionnaire touching upon a range of the issues that were going to be discussed throughout the conference. Um, and we've got, so the, we've got the results here. So, in, in particular, let's look at the first question, which bears direct relationship to this panel. How much importance do you place on each of these types of success for the English language program at your institution? Shall I read it out loud? Okay. Po number one, they have positive atmosphere among your teaching staff, good student attendance rate, high scores in student satisfaction questionnaire at the end, good results in terms of university entrance or employment, positive feedback from the parents or sponsors of your students, good retention of your teaching staff from year to year, high scores or pass rates in international English exams, then high scores or pass rate in national English exams, and the last one, positive feedback from teachers, tutors of other subjects um, in your institution. What I found really striking is that the top three, for you, had nothing to do with language. Okay? I was expecting high pass rate on international or national exams to be one of your key measures of success of your students and therefore your institutions. They were there, but they weren't in the top three. So the top three measures of success, as identified by you, are the soft skills, perhaps, the non directly related to language. Positive atmosphere among your teaching staff. I think Silvana will applaud that. I think you should, <laughs> you should be pleased about that. Good student attendance rate. Interesting. It is a measure of success, and for you is clearly an important one. And high scores in student satisfaction questionnaires. I wonder how much of that is to do with the commercial environment that we all operate in nowadays. If the students aren't happy, they'll go somewhere else. And you know, that's, that's a fact of life. I'll just zip through a couple of the other questions. They're not directly relevant to this, to this panel. I'd like to dwell on this one for a moment because we, we've, speak, we've spoken about motivation quite a lot. So how much impact do each of these factors have on the motivation of your students? Very interesting to us as publishers. The top one is topics and texts that are intrinsically interesting to them. Okay, and I'd say that's a 50-50 job there between the teacher who may use his or her own material and obviously to us as publishers. Secondly, more interaction and communicative activities in the classroom. I find that really interesting, because one thing you, you hear regularly, if informally from teachers, is that pretty much every teacher says, my students want more grammar. They want more grammar, and maybe followed swiftly by they want more vo uh, vocabulary. But here, what increases their motivation seems to be more interaction and communicative activities in the classroom. Third, then, constructive feedback, guidance on what to do next, so the teacher as a, as a guide, perhaps. More multimedia resources and activities. Role models who are similar to the students themselves. More links to students in other countries. And then finally, frequent testing. That's the bottom one. I'm not surprised. <laughs> I can't think of, of very many students who will be motivated by that. It's a fact of life. It happens, but it's not exactly one of the most thrilling things to be doing.
Over to you. Do you want to shout something out? What to you um, constitutes uh, successful learners, teachers or institutions? Any one of those? Well, we were discussing the word success itself, that success is like a point in time. And it doesn't, you know, it's like, okay, mm, you've achieved success. Whereas achievement is a process-oriented word. Mm -hmm. And success doesn't seem to embody a process. And we were saying that for all three, for learners, for teachers, for institutions, one of the key words is progress, along with output, of course. But what does success look like? Well, success is progress. It's achievement. Small steps, but with output. Very nice. Okay, so before I hand over to you, Silvano, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Because I know one of the things that you are keen on when you go in and work with institutions is exactly that, that it's a sense of progress. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Or? Yes, I think success is also an endpoint, if you like, of that process, of that particular process in time. So yes, you progress, you achieve, and at the end you succeed, which is sort of the end and the celebration. So I don't dislike the word success, and I think it works for people. People like success. They connect with success. So maybe a progress punctuated by points of success mm. Mm. Um, as a pathway. Mm. Okay, yeah. sorry, lady over there perhaps? Well, success is empowered teachers because when the teachers are empowered, then they can create an atmosphere for their students as liberated individuals because no gadget on this planet, no translator on this planet can express your feelings the way that you should be. And in order to just, you know, instead of creating passive receivers of knowledge, just creating proactive learners who are in the center of their own progress. That's what we understand. Okay. Thank you. Excellent, yes, thank you. I think one of the things that uh, we sometimes overlook is sustainability, and I don't mean that in terms of um, the environment, although that's important. I mean in terms of keeping going ourselves as educators and helping our students keep going. And uh, what I'm really talking about is looking after our wellness. Um, so looking after ourselves as educators, uh, looking after our teams, looking after each other, because that's the only way we're gonna go the distance over the years and keep the, uh, the shine in our eyes as we keep doing the same job again and again. So I think that's part of success institutionally for teachers and ultimately for learners. Okay, thank you. On that note, uh, Julian and I had a very interesting conversation over lunch the other day. And it's really hard keeping teachers motivated over the long haul, as you say. Um, on the one hand, you'd like to reward good teachers by giving them a permanent contract. On the other hand, that can have the opposite effect, that they sit back in a sense of comfort then. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So you want to keep, the, keep them going. Um, I agree with um, uh, progress. Uh, success is incremental progress. And the way to perhaps measure that is through output. Um, I hate assessment, although I had to go through a lot of them and also make a lot of assessment myself as a teacher. The ultimate assessment for me is when a learner can achieve the task he or she has set herself. Um, Laura talked about going through an interview, being successful at an interview, that's the best assessment ever. Uh, so for me, that's success. Now, I think a teacher and a learner are inter interdependent. And actually, a teacher is much more dependent on the learner than the learner is on the teacher. Because the teacher, uh, when she succeeds, or he succeeds, then feels a loss. A loss because the learner has gone away, flew the nest, okay. and has become totally independent. Some of them turn around, smile at you, wave, and may say thank you, but others just forget and go away. But we know that they have succeeded, and that loss, in fact, is a gain. So first of all, thank you to the panel. That was a you know, thank you for sharing your thoughts and stimulating ideas and for the questions. We didn't get very far with our discussion, but we initially um, sort of reacted, had to sort of reset ourselves to, to kind of think about success and learners. And when we did that, we centered our discussion first around, you know, goal setting. So, you know, obviously success is obtaining goals, but how those goals can be radically different. So on, on, on this end, on my end, where I work in a university institution, those goals are pretty well set for learners. They want to pass courses and matriculate on through their life experience. For most of them, English is not an end in and of itself. It is just a means to attain a, a reality that they're looking for later on in their life. But on the other end, we have sort of private language institutions that are in Britain, where learners come 
for really no specific purpose. They're usually youthful, young people, just sort of looking to hang out. So what is their success like in the classroom? It could just be building relationships. It could be just walking away for the summer, feeling better about yourself, and it has absolutely nothing to do with learning English. And that's one of the interesting things about our profession. As teachers in the classroom where the students sort of leave us, is that we, we are just sort of with them on a longer journey that we get to see, and not all of them can articulate. And maybe perhaps, and this might be what we were alluding to in the beginning, that articulating that success isn't necessary for everyone. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's okay. It's okay that you don't really know why you're here. Just sort of enjoy the process while you are. I would like to add that uh, whenever um, doctors make mistakes, their mistakes are in tombs. Whenever lawyers make mistakes, their mistakes are in jail. Whenever teachers make mistakes, our mistakes are everywhere. So success is uh, for everybody what we see outside. If we see somebody uh, being the right kind of person outside, uh, somebody has been successful. The learner, the teacher, or the institution. So we, uh, success can be found everywhere. And even though it's not our success, it's a teacher's success, it's a student's success, and it's an institution's success. At the beginning of this uh, uh, plenary of this conference, you talked about uh, Isaac Newton, Stephen Hawking, and um, who was the other one? Um, oh, well, I forgot the Einstein. Uh, so we have talked, we, we have three examples in there that have been revolutionary to their times, uh, but we have many others that are right in here. And we are here because we have been successful, our teachers have been successful, and our institutions have been successful. Yes. So let's see what kind of person we would like to find around the corner. And Somebody has been successful. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. I think the real challenge there is when do we measure that, that success? Not just what is success, but, but when. Um, you know, if, we, if we educate youngsters now, um, the success might not kick in for another 10, 15, 20 years. So that's a big question in itself. Lenise, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> so you have how many thousands of students a year? Um, about 143,000. What is it that you assess in them at the end of the semester or the year? Is it purely language or do you assess them in anything else? We, we do. It depends on the program a bit. Um, at the high school level, we have about 36,000 students at the high school level. Uh, we do look a lot at attitudes and values and beliefs okay. and it's built into their program and it's a tricky thing to do but we do a lot of work with teamwork and um, very specific exercises that look at social responsibility. Um, and we're looking at uh, new ways of evaluation that include uh, formative evaluation, but also um, those s metacognitive skills of self-reflection and understanding who you are as a learner. Um, so there's a lot of student evaluation. Of course, I'm speaking of the ideal. In the classroom, we're still working on getting there. Mm. Uh, but we do evaluate those, those competencies in a very specific way. Um, and in the undergraduate programs, or, uh, we look at, again, it depends a bit on, on, on what undergraduate program they're in, but the, we look a bit at those skills in a less intentional way. And this is our, what I'm calling our year of the revolution, where we're trying to figure out how to include those competencies in a very specific way in the classroom with the learner who isn't necessarily as invested in the language itself as they might be in other interests. Okay. Is that okay? Well, that, very <laughs> impressive, well done. I think what really strikes me there is that you must be very embedded in the overall teaching and learning ecosystem. Um, because those values cannot merely be taught through the channel of ELT, but it also has to be embedded in the overall learning process. I, I think that I can safely say, and anyone that knows our institution, I think you might agree with me, that we are trying to set the bar for success in UEM, and things are changing, and things are changing in big ways, because uh, other areas are turning to look at what we're doing in language. In fact, I have a leadership team with some of my coordinators, and that has just sort of gone viral around the institution. Um, Leon and his team are involved in some of that. And other directors are looking at what we're doing in language to see how they can increase those same competencies in their teaching. We're not there yet, and we won't be there for a while. But I think that it's a huge thing to change an institution like that, of that size. And it will take some time. 
I think, well, Silvana, you can probably speak to that. It's pretty much or <laughs> the challenges of turning around any size of institution. Absolutely, and yes. Yes, and it's all, you know, I um, uh, agree totally with, with Zoltan. The beginning is a vision. The beginning is setting a vision of wanting to be outstanding and to create outstanding teaching and learning experiences for all the students and work from there. So, so what are some of the carrots and sticks that could be deployed? Somebody used that term today. How do you get an institution from where they are now to, to the vision that is set? Well, there are external, if you like, carrots and sticks, which is, um, you know, the, the, you've got account, you know, accountability systems in place, like, in, you know, um, inspections and things like that. So the success of making progress from good to excellent is a good one, for example, and to take people through that process of, we want to achieve excellence. We want to, you know, and in the same way to do that for the organization. And when that happens, it's amazing. Um, but also, you know, the pride for me, the importance is the internal motivation of each member of the organization of wanting to do the best, to, you know, to, to do the, the best possible uh, job for our, for our students. And, you know, yesterday uh, Sue was talking about um, moral purpose. Um, and, and that's much more important than anything else, you know, to just uh, keep in touch with. What, what is it that makes you get up in the morning and, you know, uh, and why you're doing this? And, and constantly going back to that um, as well. So two things, sort of, you know, the measures and the external and, and, and um, positive feedback and, you know, and celebrating success and, and making people aware that they are making progress. And when I say people, I mean students, I mean teachers. That, you know, that they have developed, that there is a connection between the professional development that, that we are doing and transferability in the classroom. Um, so all that put together, but always guided by a sense of we want to do the best job we can. Wonderful. Well, in which case, thank you very much to Laura, Lenise and Silvana.